Hello and welcome back to episode 7 of how to compose cinematic music for movies, TV shows, and video games. In today's episode we are going to talk about a few more harmonic related things to help improve our theme writing just that much more. So today we're going to talk about inversions, suspensions, and cadences and introduce the ideas and concepts, show a chord progression at the end which takes advantage of all three of these things, and moving forward, having knowledge of what these three things are is really going to help us improve our theme writing with more interesting chords and harmonic language. So let's hop on over into Ableton and take a look at these three concepts. Okay, so here we are in Ableton. As you can see, I've got a few different things laid out in MIDI here. The first is going to be inversions. So let's open up the piano roll and take a look at what we've got going on. So up until this point, we've been working in C minor. For the purpose of understanding some of these concepts, I'm just gonna use C major because it's a little bit easier and a lot of the traditional examples of these concepts are given in C major. So I'm just gonna stick with what's traditional. But once we get back to our theme writing, we're gonna stick to C minor. So C major uses all the white keys on the keyboard, but just to make it more simple, I am going to open up the key function within Ableton. So I'm going to hit scale here, and then it defaults to C major. I can hit scale here, and now we've got all notes which are in C major. So what I've got on my screen in front of you are four chords, or what appears to be four chords, but really kind of technically this is only just one chord. It's three different versions of one chord, and then one chord repeated twice with two different voicings. Now. At a certain point, we're going to be comfortable with all with what all of that means. But for now, let me just show you. So this first chord here is a C major chord because it's got the three notes which make up C major. It's got C, E, G, and then again this C. And this is what we referred to as a chord in closed voicing. We're going to talk more about voicings in later episodes because it really applies to orchestration and composition a lot more. But just for now, just remember that this is a closed voicing because of how tightly together these notes are. They could not possibly be any closer together without changing the chord. We'd have to add a new note. If we wanted to make this C closer, for instance, we'd have to make it a different note, which would change the quality of the chord. So in order to have this be a C major, which has four unique notes, this is as close of a voicing as we can have. And thus we get a sound which sounds like this. Now this next chord here is also a C major chord, but it is what we refer to as in first inversion. And that is because if I were to take this C note from our first chord and move it up, now the next note in our chord is E. So this is the first inversion because it's the first next note we could use in creating a C major chord. Now remember that the quality of a chord is always determined by the notes in it, not their ordering. So this is still C major because it's got the three notes that make up C major. It's got E, C, G, and E but it's in first inversion. We could also refer to this as a C over E, and that sounds like this. The next is going to be in second inversion, which is the same thing, but with G in the bass. And then at the end here, we've got a C major back in root position, uh, spaced a little bit more openly. So now if I play these chords back to back to back, Hopefully it'll give you a little bit of a basic idea and introduction as to what inversions and slash chords are. So the next topic I want to talk about are what are referred to as suspensions. Now there are different types of suspensions, but the two most common that we're going to run into are what are referred to as suspended two chords or suspended four chords, more commonly just called sus4 or sus2. So let's open up the piano roll again. And what I've got in front of us this time is a B flat major chord because it's a major chord that appears in C minor and both the suspended two version of B flat and the suspended four also naturally appear in C minor. So in our theme writing in the beginning, as we're composing in C minor, these are going to be chords which are both going to be options to us. So first things first, we've got this B flat major voiced like this. Now, this is a major chord because it has the root, the fifth, and the third, the major third away from B flat. Remember that if we start counting up from B flat and we go one, two, three, four, we arrive upon D. And if we go one, two, three, we arrive upon F. And that is how we get the voicing for our major chord. Now, these are vo this is voiced in a very open voicing. 
I'm skipping one note of the chord per voice. This is how we get what's called an open voicing. And so it's gonna sound a little bit more big and glamorous. And in order to get a suspended two or a suspended four chord, it's actually remarkably simple. All you do to get the suspended two chord is you go down two notes from your major third, but you leave the root and the fifth the same. So in this case, we would get something that sounds like this. And to get our suspended four, we go up one semitone or one note from our major third, and we get something that sounds like this. Now, the reason that we go down two notes and up one note is because if we think about our major scale, let's just imagine we were in B flat major, right? So the voice, the spacing of our major scale is gonna go whole step, we start on B flat, we go whole step up to the C, whole step up to the D, half step up to the E flat, and then whole step up to the F. That would be us walking up the B flat major scale. So in order to get a B flat major, of course, we've got our B flat, our D and an F. But if we're in B flat major, it wouldn't be correct to call it a sus two to go down to this D flat because that note doesn't appear in B flat major. We would get an entirely different sounding chord. It's not necessarily bad, it's just not one that would appear in B flat major. So in order to get the sus two, we go down to the C. And this E flat, the reason we only go up one is because in B flat major, this E flat is the fourth note of B flat. So we get this sound. So in front of us, we've got a B flat major chord, a B flat suspended two chord, and a B flat suspended four chord. Let's listen to what these sound like. And what you'll notice is something that's gonna lead us into an entirely different topic for another day, and that is the concept of leading tones. If I duplicate this B-flat sus4 chord and resolve it down into the B-flat major, listen to how satisfying this is because of how badly this E-flat wants to go down just that one note back to D. This is a strong leading tone because it's only one note away. Let's listen to this. We can make it stand out even more by only having that one note change and let these uh, let the others just sustain a very nice and satisfying resolution and speaking of satisfying resolutions we are going to move on into cadences now cadences are very complex and i can't cover them all in this introduction video we're going to cover them more in depth as we start writing more themes but for now i just want to get the concept as clearly understood just the concept of it as I can make it. Now I've referenced them in videos leading up until this point, but I would just like to go over some of the basic textbook examples of what cadences are, so that if you haven't heard before, you can familiarize your ear with what it is to end a musical thought. And that is what cadences are doing for us. They are giving us finished musical thoughts. They are functioning as musical punctuation, periods, commas, exclamation marks, etc. It's so important to have our music sound like one flowing, moving piece of, of music to have these rest points, to have clarity as to where we're going, to not have things be a run-on sentence, to let certain ideas feel finished so that we can move on to others. This concept, I know for myself, was definitely overlooked in the beginning because it's really fun to focus on big, interesting, epic moments in music. But in order to get those, a lot of the time what you need are more moments of just finishedness and a sort of simplicity and basicness that allows the other more complex parts to really stand out. So let's go over some of the authentic cadences and we're gonna give two examples of what this is. So the authentic cadence is this concept of feeling musically complete. This is as musically complete as we traditionally get. I'm gonna show you two examples out of classical music which end on our tonic chord, meaning our one chord, and these examples I'm gonna give are in C major. So we're gonna end on a C major in root position, meaning that it's not in an inversion. C is gonna be in the bass, and you're gonna hear how complete these sound. So let's take a listen to the first. Incredibly complete, incredibly satisfying. So satisfying to the point where it sounds cheesy. I promise not all of your cadences need to sound this cheesy. There are things we can do to spice them up a little bit, but 
don't be afraid when you're ending your themes. In fact, I would say more than don't be afraid. Please, when you're ending your themes, find some way to include a cadence, particularly when you're ending your music. If you want it to sound satisfying and done, you're going to need to include a cadence, something that sounds sort of cheesy and overdone and not original. This reference to non-original, commonly understood concepts in music are going to allow the other parts of your music, which are maybe more exploratory or unique, to stand out and be more fun. And the listener is going to be willing to go there with you on that journey because you've got these pieces of music. You've got these parts of your music which they are completely familiar with and completely understand. So let's listen to the second example from our authentic cadences. Once again, cheesy, but complete. So the next concept is going to be a half cadence. This means we're ending on our five chord almost always. Not always, but particularly in major, the go-to example is to end on your major five chord. So in C major, this would be a G major. So let's listen to what this half cadence sounds like. Now you'll notice that that piece of music feels like it wants to keep going. It's both complete and that we have established a clear thought here, but it also has this feeling of wanting to keep moving. Now I should say technically here, because I'm going from one to five to one to five, that this is functioning more as a prolongational progression, but screw the, the technical theory for a moment. The important thing to understand, because we're not writing classical music, is just that this is going to sound, this, this one five ending on the five instead of going back to the one is what gives us this sense of half cadence. This is gonna be a great thing to use all throughout your music to let the listener know you've completed a thought, but that there's still more to go. So the next thing we've got here is what is referred to as a deceptive cadence. So this is setting up the listener for what they think is going to be the tonic or the one chord, and instead we're gonna give them something else. So in the last video I talked about tonic predominant and dominant function, and I noted that the, there are three chords which have tonic function, right? There's the one chord, but there's also the three and the six chord. So one way to deceive our listeners is to give a different version of the tonic than our root. So we're gonna, in this case, in C major, I'm gonna give an A minor first before I give the C major. So we're gonna hear a deceptive cadence, which leads into an authentic cadence, which is going to make things sound interesting and a little bit confusing and maybe not confusing, but a little bit more unanticipated. And then when we resolve to the C major in the end, it feels that much more satisfying. So let's take a listen to this. sounds really complete and finished and something straight out of classical music. And that's where a lot of our basic uh, examples of cadences come from. But there's a reason for this. And it's not because we need to copy them exactly. But the reason that they're used as examples is to make the point that I was just making. These are so familiar to the point where they sound cheesy. But even someone who's never composed any music before understands listening to these exactly their musical purpose because of how much we've heard them. And that is the purpose of cadences, is to be boring, is to end your thought, but completely end your thought so that you can start the next one without the listener being confused. So with all of those three topics in mind, let's move on to a chord progression which is going to be written in C minor and is going to sound a little bit more like something you might hear in modern music for movies, TV shows, and video games. Of course, there's no theme here. These are just some chords, but I'm making use of different inversions, suspensions, and a authentic cadence in the end in minor, ending on my five chord leading to the one chord, which is gonna give us that sense of completion. So let's take a listen to that before we move on to next week's video where we start writing more themes. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. That is it for now. I will catch you all next time. Take care.